Okay, so component-driven front-end development. Um, so who am I? I'm John Enyu. I work for Deason, a digital agency in the UK. Um, we provide full design build services and deliver reasonably large websites. Uh, our typical projects are about six to nine months. Um, and our primary, primary technology stack is, is Drupal 8, um, but we also work with a number of front-end technologies uh, like Angular React, um, and we do uh, development using applications such as Symfony React and uh, Laravel as well. Um, so what's this talk about? I'm going to be describing the journey that decent has gone through over the last th three years, um, where we've gone from a very waterfall design process um, and development to, um, to take on these ideas of component-driven development, which um, I believe requires a very agile approach to the way that you actually run your projects. Um, so maybe you'll see some parallels from your own experiences and your own businesses. Um, and I'm not suggesting anything in here that's the one true way. Some of our approaches will work for you um, and others, depending on your business and, and your team and everything. Um, it, it probably you, you will disagree with some of the things I have to say. Um, there's nothing... <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so there's nothing revolutionary in this talk. Um, I'm going to summarize a series of ideas by others, and I'll reference them where appropriate to give you our favorite reading material um, and where you can find the best descriptions of some of these concepts. Um, so the format of this talk is this. Uh, for the approach to work, I firmly believe you need to embrace Agile with a big A and break yourself of a waterfall design process. Um, in developing design systems, I'll describe the move from designing full pages to producing a design system which is comp um, a component library and a style guide. And finally, we'll look at how you can make that style guide a living style guide so that the design system itself is a part of your Drupal website. So first and foremost, websites are built by people. And projects succeed or fail primarily on the quality of the communication and the decision making that comes about through collaborative work. The Agile Manifesto uh, values in individuals' interactions over processes and tools. So the more collaboration on a project and the more engaged all the team members are, then the more likely it is to succeed. Um, so you might recognize this kind of waterfall approach to delivery, and this is certainly what we were doing um, two or three years ago. Um, each discipline only gets involved with their phase of the project. Um, and we thought that we were being very efficient with this and with people's times, but this is a false economy. Uh, value is lost and members of each discipline fail to inform the stage before. So we tended to have a very large design phase up front and designed the key pages where we designed the key pages of the site. In fact, we'd often design all the pages of the site um, and then give clients free range uh, to waste their budget endlessly discussing those. Um, Brad Frost, who... Um, I'll mention a bit later on as well, who's got some of the, the ideas in this talk. Um, he describes this process well with a little story about the idea of producing these beautifully completed designs and they're being deli uh, delivered to the front end team who might be in a different part of the building or in a different country or continent. Um, and they, these design package gets pushed under the door with a note on it saying, it's all signed off so nothing can change. Oh, and by the way, we've only got three weeks of budget left. Uh, then everyone kills themselves to get it delivered in a rush, um, but no one is ultimately pleased with the end result. Um, so we needed to stop doing this. And so what we wanted to do is move to a, a process that looks more like this, a collaborative workflow involving a continuous cross-disciplinary team working throughout the entire process. While the amount of active work might change for each discipline, they're always consulted in order that their knowledge is um, always present in every piece of work that's produced from start to finish. This is hard to start doing, and often, the project, uh, often at the start of a project, new clients will still want to work in the old waterfall way. Um, they see a safety net in the sign-off process, um, and it is difficult to break them of this and start them trusting you to work collaboratively. Um, our creative director usually gives a little speech now at the beginning saying that they need to be brave, um, and they'll get an award-winning website, but they do have to trust us to deliver. So in part two, we're talking about developing design systems. Um, so when, when our clients came to us thinking about websites, what they were really thinking about was a collection of pages. Um, and that concept of a page is very key in the language of the web and the way that the web 
um, has evolved. So in, typically there's questions around, well, how long will a page take to build or how many pages will this website have in it? Um, and the problem with this is the design level is that each page developed becomes a unique collection of things. Oops. Um, and of course, it's those things on the page that are actually going to be built and are actually going to affect the cost of development. The more things that are defined by a designer, the greater the size of the project. So that a project with only a handful of page designs can be much more complex than a project with many page designs, which are much simpler. Um, so fundamentally, we need to stop designing pages and stop sharing those pages with clients. A page designs are static and they don't ac accurately represent how the design is going to present on the huge number of devices that the page will end up on. Um, and I think it was Stephen Hay who said something like presenting fully formed Photoshop page designs to the client is the most effective way to show your client what the website will never look like. So we're not designing systems of pages. Instead, we're going to be designing a system of components. And this is a key concept to teach your team. All the disciplines need to understand this, from UX to design to front end to back end. We're looking for the individual components used throughout the design. Uh, modularity is the key to successful design and a successful project. In the waterfall approach laid out earlier, the front end developer does not have a chance to input their wisdom into the design process. Indeed, when your design team is completely separate from your front end and development teams, it becomes increasingly difficult to evolve the design as the technology and the results of the implementation are seen and understood. So what exactly is a component? Um, a component is a concept. It's hard to give it an exact definition. A simple one might be a, a small collection of things on the page or a single feature that the site is going to produce. The important thing is that the team agrees on what the components are, what their names are, uh, in such a way that their purpose is, is truly understood. And this has to be a collaborative effort. So here um, are some examples uh, from a recent project we've done. So perhaps you consider the header of the site a component, a content listing, um, or the footer. Um, and a chap called Brad Frost did a lot of the work on uh, coming up with this idea of atomic design um, three or four years ago, um, which puts additional rigor around the component way of thinking. And it defines an approach to producing a design system and a way of thinking about design systems. Um, I highly recommend that blog post and the book that he's written as well. Um, so in, in, his, um, in his idea, we break a design down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, so he has the idea of atoms, which are the base typographical elements, such as headings and buttons on the page. Um, and then from those base parts, you can then combine them to produce molecules, which may be slightly larger elements, such as a search form. Um, and then finally, up to organisms and so forth, where uh, the heading might be an organism on the page or some component of the page, which is then reused. Adopting the atomic design principle system gives you a consistent approach to how you go about setting up a design system for your web project. Um, and there's a tool that goes alongside this called Pattern Lab. Uh, which I won't go into uh, in, in this talk, but uh, you can find out more from Brad Frost's website. So the end product of this approach is a style guide. Um, a good style guide isn't something that just shows off the various aspects of the design. Used properly, they are a collaboration tool, bringing the design and the development teams together and, act, um, and bridging those two teams and acting as the focal point of your collaborations. It's a tool to break down the user interface into its component parts rather than thinking about it as a whole or as a series of pages. The client can browse through it and see it working. And because it is in a browser, we can see how the components will react on every device. They also serve as a resource for new designers and developers to get an understanding of the entire system in one place. And it helps for future work where the team can locate existing patterns and combine the smaller elements to create new, larger sized elements. This helps lock the design system in place and prevents the creation of large numbers and new stylistic elements every time a new feature on the site is commissioned. So what's the point of developing a neat, de a neat design system? Um, I like this image. Um, this is from, from one of uh, Brad Frost's pages. But uh, without a design system, the bits of your design end up being like the, the scatter pile of Lego bricks. All the bits are there but you have to rummage around to find the right parts. If you can't find it, or you don't know uh, a bit uh, actually exists, you might be tempted to bring in a new piece or to complete your project, further enlarging and complicating that pile. Um, and I think if you looked at any 
older Drupal themes, then working your way through them might feel a bit like shifting through a pile of Lego bricks. Um, so taking the time to organize your pieces allows you to approach the development of new components in a consistent and efficient manner. Um, certainly there's time involved in doing this, but it's, it's time that pays off in the long run. Now the new feature builder can see exactly what is available for them to use. And now the changes to the design system can flow through to all the back-end systems that might make use of it. The development of new features is, is um, much simpler. So here are some real examples from a project. Um, here we see a single atom being an example of a button, a molecule, which is a piece of teaser, and then an organism, which may be the uh, panel listing. So we start thinking about what, what, what would be a good process um, for your team in order to produce this. Um, for a start, for us, this starts at the UX phase, where the UX analyst has identified a pattern uh, in the emerging project. They name it and they define its purpose. Um, and this is the point where the team then gathers together uh, to work on these patterns, to understand them and truly understand them. Um, at this point, the team will get involved to annotate the data attributes and their types. And in theory, this is sufficient for the re entire rest of the team to work on a component in a single sprint. Um, the designer will then design the component in collaboration with the front-ender who is building it out in our component front-end tool system. Uh, this may be Pattern Lab or it may be another tool. Um, whilst the back-ender is building the content types and views necessary to support it in Drupal. It's possible that when you get good at this, you'll find that the designer doesn't even need to share uh, Photoshop designs or sketch designs with the client for sign-off at all, uh, even at just the component level and the component library itself are all that needs to be shared. Um, and so you, you can get to a point where you're actually developing an evolving solution uh, where the front-ender can start by producing placeholder elements, given that they know what's involved in creating those elements because there was the collaboration beforehand. And as the design becomes available, they can then start filling in the gaps and refining the output. Um, so that's all great in theory. We've built a neat design system. We've used a tool like Pattern Lab, um, and we have a fancy uh, style guide to showcase, showcase what's been designed. But how? But what happens when we try and bring this into Drupal? So Drupal uses a template-based theming system. Um, here on the board, we can see that the templates folder of one of the core Drupal themes. Uh, markup is organized in the theme based on the conventions of the CMS. So we have things in there that you have to know all about Drupal in order to work with this. Um, blocks, content, views, for example. Uh, code is duplicated across these templates. It's not uncommon to find, for example, um, a content template file for each uh, content type in a Drupal website. And much of the markup in each of these content files is, uh, is repeated from one content type to the next. Um, or you have single templates which have an awful lot of switches or nested ifs inside them. Um, so in, in this case, the markup isn't dry, which is uh, an acronym for do not repeat yourself. Um, the code isn't modular in the way that the code in our style guide um, will, will be. Now, if we want to make a change or introduce a new template to a Drupal theme, we start to see some of these problems. Uh, for a new content type, we have to build a new template and copy and paste the markup from one template to another. And if we make a change to the base styling, we don't want to go searching for every instance of a pattern through all the templates. Also, if we have a design system and a style guide, then we are copying and pasting markup from the style guide into the CMS system, and there's code duplication again. And finally, changes made as the project evolves are unlikely to find their way back into that style guide. Usual project strains and time constraints are naturally going to mean that changes get applied directly to the CMS and the Drupal theme, and the style guide will slowly drift out of sync with the systems that it's supposed to be supporting. When this happens, the style guide ceases to be useful, and in fact can be a cause of misdirection and confusion between the project team members, as they reference different versions of the truth that's stored in different places. What we need is the style guide templates and CSS to be pulled into the right points um, of the Drupal theme so that it's sharing the same code. Um, here's another theme in core. This is the seventh theme. Um, separation of concerns uh, here relates to the ability to put similar bits of code together so that it's easy to, easy to reason about them. Um, 
the concern should be around a concept or something that that a developer knows that they're only going to work on one thing. Um, the approach taken by this theme, um, which is a fairly standard Drupal theme pattern, is to organize the elements of the theme by file extension. So all the CSS is in a folder together, all the JavaScript is in a JS folder, and all the HTML markup is in the templates folder. Um, so this is separation by file type, not by concept. When developing a component, we want everything about that component to be contained together. It's markup in the form of twig templates, it's CSS, and it's JavaScript, and any JavaScript associated with it. The problem with this approach is that the developer must jump around to make changes to any specific element. It's likely that they will work on the HTML and the CSS concerning a single page element at the same time, but must hunt down the bits they need in order to change. With a component-based approach, all the aspects of the component should be stored together. The folder should be named after the component, and, uh, and in it, we should find everything we need to work on, its markup, and twig file, CSS, and any JavaScript. To further modulize the, uh, the CSS, uh, we use um, SAS and the block element modifier, or BEM approach, to ensure that the CSS defined in the component only affects that component. This avoids problems where changing CSS can have unexpected consequences on other parts of the code base. Um, if you're not familiar with the BEM standard, then I recommend uh, looking it up. Um, so here's a trivial code example of what a, a component might look like. Um, this is the template code for a button on a page. So we've defined the variables that can be passed into this template, um, a URL and the text of a button. Uh, yep, sorry. Um, and then what we want to be able to do then is to use that, uh, that template that was built for our style guide, for our style, styling system. We want to be able to use it in Drupal. Uh, and I'm going to just describe two approaches to doing that. Um, and this is one we, we've, we've used um, a small amount of, and then there's another one that um, we use slightly more, more often. Um, this uses some libraries that we built for our front end process. Um, and the, the link at the bottom there will, will give you more information about exactly how this works. Um, but we're using a modern build, uh, build tool set up, so Webpack, Docker, et cetera. And we've got an, in, um, an integration library. And each component that gets created inside of our front end system uh, gets its own theme function um, inside of Drupal. And this is auto-generated auto code that we include there inside of that hook theme implementation. Um, so that when, within Drupal, the Drupal developer can then use any of those uh, components that got created. Uh, inside the style guide um, as they wish within the Drupal, uh, within the Drupal theme. Um, the other approach is to include the design system templates directly inside of Drupal templates. Um, so Drupal is acting as a bridge, or the Drupal theme is acting as a bridge between Drupal itself and our design system. Um, this requires the use of components module for Drupal 8, um, and the instructions for this are on the components module page. Uh, so with this approach, you need to specify where your additional twig templates are stored um, in relation to your theme uh, inside the theme uh, info YAML file. Uh, then you can include those templates, as I've done here with another trivial example. Um, this is the page title uh, HTML twig template file, which normally just contains the fixed markup uh, of a H1 element for a page. And all we've done here is pass through the variables supplied in a Drupal way to the variables that we defined would be needed for our component. So the component itself doesn't include any specific Drupalisms within it, um, and makes no assumption about the, the names or the naming scheme used for the individual variables. The idea with both methods that I've described there is that you're not creating markup inside of your Drupal theme. Markup is pulled from your design system. Oops, sorry. So hopefully with these examples, you can see the, the power of the, the options that are available. By using includes or custom theme functions, the Drupal theme can be used as a bridge between the design system, uh, which was specifically designed for a client, and the client's domain language and the client's project, and the Drupal CMS. We've removed the need to introduce Drupal naming conventions and standards to the design system or static style guides. Um, we've also removed the need for the front enders to know Drupal um, at all so it's possible to have very specialized front-end developers who, work, who can work entirely 
inside the design system, concentrating their energies on the development of awesome front end. The Drupal developers are also freed from the complexities of implementing the design and only need to work on bridging the two systems. And finally, we've created um, a living style guide as opposed to a static style guide, as Drupal is using the same templates as the style guide itself. So any change from one will be uh, carried into the other, and the two don't fall out of sync. Um, so yes, briefly in, uh, in conclusion, uh, decoupling your UI elements from your application development process um, is beneficial. Using component design process to focus on reducing complexity and increasing reusability. And most importantly, I think, move away from a waterfall design process um, into one that is truly agile and encompasses the entire team. So this is my reading list. Um, it's, uh, I'm sure a number of you have seen quite a few of these things before, but um, if you haven't, there's some really good um, examples there from Brad Frost's uh, blog post and, and um, Event Apart video where he describes the atomic design approach and, and Pattern Lab. Um, the Lonely Planet guide there talks about uh, the creation of a maintainable style guide and why that's important. Um, um, Four Kitchens did a, uh, a Drupal tutorial, set of tu uh, tutorial videos which cover um, um, many of the things I've described here today as well. Um, and then finally, um, at the bottom there, we've got uh, Deason's approach to front-end development, which includes some of the libraries that um, I, I, I described um, when integrating the uh, templates into uh, your Drupal theme. So, thank you very much. So, we've got two minutes if anyone wants to ask any questions. Oh, sorry, do you want to go? It's a mic. <laughs> So how do you present uh, the um, modular-based kind of aspects to your clients um, if you don't present them a whole page, for example? Do you, so, yeah, you, how do they cope with that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, and it's, it's, it's a process that you have to go through, I think, to, um, to be able to get to that level of trust. Um, early, early in a project cycle, um, we run something called a feasibility workshop very early on. Um, and as part of that, uh, we, we sit down with the client to describe both the approach in quite some detail, but also to understand the feasibility of their project, both from a cost perspective, a technology perspective, a brand perspective, but also from the team perspective. So we have to understand from them, is your team ready for an agile project? Yeah. And in the case, and what comes out at the end of a feasibility workshop will be a report that says, your team likes the ideas, but they're not quite there yet. Um, and so we'll, prov we'll provide training in order to get to that point. Mm. Um, and e even at that point, there's um, uh, certainly an element of, yeah, but we still need to see some designs. We need to sign off on something at yeah. some point. Um, so through the foundation stages of a project, which we, won't, we wouldn't want to last more than two to four weeks, um, we developed something called the design direction, which is uh, essentially focused on those lower level building block elements. So it's kind of, this is the feel for where you're going, but it's not it's not the entirety and it's certainly not the finished product so don't look at this and think this is what you're going to get because it, it won't go that way okay. um, and it's that continuous conversation that, that builds that trust and builds that understanding how it works i find people are easier to, to talk to about agile these days anyway because it's kind of in a lot of people's minds yeah. but it certainly isn't universally true lovely thank, thank you, you. <laughs> hi um i'm just curious to know your thoughts on um <clears throat> a component-based approach with Twig, where you're having to try and couple things together and try and structure your file system together to get everything, you know, closer, decoupled but coupled, compared to something like Vue, where you have a Vue file where your markup, your JS, and your styling language is, um, and your thoughts on like how Drupal could possibly move forwards in this area. Yeah, so it's a good question, and I think when you get into this, uh, the, the examples in here are pretty trivial, um, and you, you'll certainly come up with some uh, some blocks along the way of things like, uh, how do we actually implement this inside of Drupal? And Four Kitchens have got some good, um, uh, their, their, their video tutorial system, um, series goes into this in a bit more detail. We haven't really got the time to go into it now. But yeah, certainly there, there are approaches that you can take in, in all of these things. But I think the, the key thing is to be quite flexible with your approach. Um, so. 
again, the, as with any project, you're going to hit roadblocks along the way. There's going to be things that are going to be difficult to do, but that good conversation between your Drupal developer and your front-end developer, rather than sticking to a very rigid, well, our front-end is only going to look like this, and being able to be flexible in the way that they work as well, so that the two things can work together, is the most important thing. So keeping conversations open and being collaborative it's sure. the bottom line. But Do you <laughs> find it hindering, though, to stick within the Drupal front-end system of using something like Twig? Whereas, like, you know, I, I recently tried to take on a project where I combined, I kept within Drupal as the front-end layer and tried to combine Vue into it, and I just felt that it was far too much of a struggle to still try and work within Drupal, whereas if I just go headless, which seems to be the theme of this DrupalCon, mm -hmm. it was a lot simpler to get a component-driven design. Yeah. yeah, certainly. And I think we, I mean, we, we build headless systems as well, so I think there's, there's, there's pros and cons to both approaches. Certainly. But yeah, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> uh, have you thought about uh, implementing these, these uh, StartGuard components as plugins of some sort, like formatters, uh, views plugins, and are, does it not, does it, do you see that match there, or do you think that some should be separate? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's elements of things you can do there, um, but the, the need to separate the two, I think, is quite important. Um, so we have some, um, if you have a look at our demo site, if you follow that bottom link and start to have a look and, and explore what we've done, you'll start to see some of the examples of, um, of, of, of the way that we've kind of thought about some of these things. Um, but yeah. I don't think there's any specifics around how we're going to do that yet. Um, yeah. We've only been doing I mean, if, if you would be interested in that, I have a module called RenderKit, which is uh, aimed to have more smaller, fine-grained components, which would be, could more easily be mapped to uh, these kind of style guide components. Ren render render kit. kit. Render kit. Yeah. Everyone check that so. out. Thanks. I'm going to have to stop. Maybe up. I will make a buff about that, maybe. <laughs> we've run out of time, so um, I'll, I'll have yeah. to take some questions afterwards. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, you know where it's on, you can come down there.